Part 1 You will hear a conversation between Peter and Jim talking about some details for their shared accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hey Jim, it's Peter. Oh hey Peter, what's up? I thought I'd call so we could hammer out the details for next year's lease. That's a good idea. Did we ever decide on how to split the total rent? Well, I was thinking, since my room is bigger, I probably should pay a little more. So I could pay £110, and you could pay £80. Does that sound OK? Considering that my old apartment cost me £100 for a smaller room, I'm definitely all right with that. Hey, I was looking at a map of the area and can't seem to find a bus stop near it. Do you know where we would catch the bus? Well, the bus is actually pretty far from us, but we have that garage that we can park our cars in. Wow, that's great. Convenient parking is hard to find, so we're lucky we have that. OK, so we have a whole lot of things we'll need to buy when we move in. How do you want to split that up? I was wondering, do you still work at the supermarket? Yep, every Tuesday and Saturday. Would you be able to buy things from there if I sent you a shopping list? Sure, I can do that. Great, then I can take care of whatever else we need that you wouldn't get at a supermarket. If you want, I'll pick you up from work that day and we can go to the apartment together. Oh, that would be great, thanks. No problem. That way we can split the cost of petrol. Works for me. It's so expensive these days, isn't it? It's downright obscene. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. So let's figure out what appliances we need. Do we have a microwave? Yes, the landlord's providing that for us. Hey, do you still have that space heater though? We need one for the kitchen since it's not connected to the central heating. All right, I'll bring that. Anything else? Well, I have some dining room and living room furniture I can bring, so that should take care of most of the big stuff. You know what we do need though? Could you bring a toaster? I actually don't have one. It doesn't come with the microwave. No, the landlord is only supplying the microwave. It would really help if you could bring one. OK, I'll pick one up at the store. You know, I also have this cool antique rotary phone that would be a cool addition to the apartment, sort of as decoration and utility. Oh, cool. The only thing is, we'd have to put it in the kitchen unless you want it in your room. Why not put it in the living room? The living room's too loud to have a phone conversation. The noise sort of carries, so if one person is trying to watch TV or have friends over, the person on the phone won't be able to hear. Hmm. OK, well I guess kitchen it is then. Any other big things we need? That seems like everything. That's all I can think of. And of course, move in is... June the 1st. I can't wait, we'll be able to watch the big game in our new apartment. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, we can move in in the morning, and then Friday night we can sit back and cheer on Liverpool. I have an exam in the morning, but we'll be done around 11am and can move in after. Wait, Liverpool? You're joking, right? I thought you were a Manchester United fan. Man you? No way. Liverpool all the way. Oh no, I, I don't know if I can live with a Liverpool fan. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2 You'll hear an HR representative of Earn and Learn giving some information about her company. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to all of you. Can everybody see and hear me? Good. I'm Sarah Connor, an HR representative of Earn and Learn. I have been asked today to talk to you about our company. So, for those of you who don't know very much about the company, let me start by giving you some basic information about it. Earn and Learn started nearly 20 years ago. It is not a charity, but a for-profit company that enables promising entrepreneurs to make money while travelling. During the past 10 years, it has grown rapidly and has gained great influence in most countries of the world. We have a partnership with the school and take a large number of recent graduates from the business school. So, if you are a recent graduate, I'd say you can consider applying to our company. Before your application, you might be curious about what sort of places you could go to. There are four main locations, but you also have the freedom to submit a different location, and if they can make the necessary arrangements, you can go. The first country Earn and Learn established locations was the US, where you may choose from multiple locations, as long as you can commit to their more rigid schedule of August to December. Also, you could do the Australia internship. That one is really cool. You work at a wildlife shelter and learn about the business practices of non-profit organisations. You do have to be willing to commit eight months for that one, though. Perhaps that's a long time to be so far away, but I would say it is really an amazing opportunity. I don't know whether some of you are in decent physical shape. If so, the South Africa internship is another exciting one. You learn a lot about sustainable farming, but you would be doing some of the manual labour involved in maintaining a farm. Indeed, it's hard work, but I think you would definitely be able to do it. It may be wise to wait until after their summer is over, so it's not so terribly hot. In addition, there is a most recently established location in India. This one gives you more of a study abroad feel, given that they arrange a host family for you to stay with. In the other locations, you live in an apartment with other interns, so this is definitely a unique experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Regardless of where you go, at the end of the programme you get a global travelling certificate, as long as you can explain your experience. You can provide a written log of what you did. I recommend writing journal or blog entries about what you do every day, or a weekly summary of each day. Of course, you don't have to write up a formal report or anything like that, and you need to apply for it once you have returned. Some students may want to know whether this is a paid internship. Actually, you have to pay for the flight there yourself. But you have the opportunity to create your own small business, which could earn you money if it's successful. So basically, you pay for it all up front, but when you're there, you can find ways to make money. That is to say, you pay for two-thirds of the cost up front as a deposit, and then give the final instalment one month prior to your return. Finally, I have to remind you that you need a health check before you go, to make sure you're not going to spread any communicable diseases. In addition, before you go, you don't have to attend any meetings or workshops. You'll meet everyone you'll be working with once you get there. OK. Well, that's all I've time for today. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. That is the end of Part 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to Part 2.
Part 3 You will hear a student called Margaret Parkinson talking about the class she missed on Thursday with her professor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Professor Timmons. Do you have a few minutes? I was hoping to talk about what I missed on Thursday. Hello, come in. Sure, sit down. Could you tell me your name, please? Margaret, sir. Margaret Parkinson. I apologise for missing your class, but I had to go to the hospital. I'm sorry to hear that. Everything is OK now, though, I hope. Yes, thanks. Glad to hear it. So on Thursday, I outlined the research project that will account for 30% of your grade. All students will be divided into groups and will give a well-researched presentation to the class covering a specific topic relevant to student life. Oh, that sounds interesting. Can we choose just any topic that pertains to life as a student, like how to start your own student organisation? Well, though I'm sure that would be an informative presentation, I've already chosen a list of topics which I will assign. As an example, I assigned one group the topic of student loans. They're to research not just the prevalence of students who have loans to pay for their tuition, but information as to how best to manage these loans and possible scholarships that could alleviate some of the financial burden. That one sounds particularly interesting to me. Could I request that topic? I could easily find out a lot about it by stopping by the finance office on my way to class. Unfortunately, that one's already taken by another group. I have, however, assigned you to a group and given you all one of two choices. Oh, I see. What are the choices? The first is discussing smoking. Trends in the number of student smokers compared with the general population, popular reasons students take up smoking, and more healthy alternatives to smoking. Hmm, that one could be interesting. I'm not a smoker myself, but we'll see what my group thinks. If we did choose this topic, we would rather not put our fellow students on the spot to interview them. Where else could we gather information? How about where the cigarettes are sold? Oh, that's a great idea. I could interview the manager of a supermarket and find out the average age of people buying cigarettes, or how much they buy, that sort of thing. Precisely. OK, I'll keep that in mind. And what was the other topic? The other topic is the practice of natural medicine. It sounds far more specific than the others, but it is more of an exercise of outlining a career path. If your group chooses this, you would cover the specifics of becoming a doctor of natural medicine, how to become licensed to practice natural medicine, what the career outlook is, etc. You could find much of the information you need on this in the careers office. Wow! That would be really helpful, not just in learning about natural medicine, but in how to approach researching any career path. That's the idea. I want groups to really think outside the box to find information on their topics. They should interview multiple sources. OK, now I think I have the general idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 27 to 30. When is the presentation due? I expect each group to send me an email attachment of the plan ahead of time by October 10th so that I can ensure that you are on the right track. Oh, that's actually really reassuring. I would hate to spend so much time on a presentation only to find we had taken it in the wrong direction. So, when is the presentation? I let groups choose from the list of time slots I have between November 1st and November 5th. OK, how about the 3rd? I'll have to check with my group, of course, but maybe we could write a tentative time? Sure, let me take a look. 
I'm actually booked completely through the third and fourth now. How about some time in the afternoon of the fifth? Great. How about two o'clock? No problem. I'll pencil your group in. Okay, thanks. And to clarify, what exactly is due in the first phase? Before the October deadline, I want your group to have compiled resources and then to provide some initial data analysis to support your claims. Okay. So data analysis is due the tenth of October, and then the um the presentation. Yes, the final phase is simply giving the presentation on the fifth of November. All right, I think I have all the information I need. Thanks. You're welcome. See you in class tomorrow. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear an introduction about an eco-friendly building called the Gherkin. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Today, I'd like to tell you about how UK architects are playing their part to address the issue of global warming. You have seen many of these iconic buildings while going about your everyday life, but you may not know how they are affecting your tomorrow. In two thousand and three. Construction was completed on the famous Swiss Rebuilding, or more informally called the Gherkin, a true masterpiece commissioned by the law offices of Foster and Partners. This is not the first ambitious endeavour of the firm; they are renowned for their various philanthropic environmental efforts. The Gherkin, with its cutting-edge green initiative and sharp design, is gaining recognition as an icon in modern architecture. You can pick it out of the London skyline by its unorthodox cigar shape. While its appearance is the obvious attribute at which to marvel, there is far more to this building than meets the eye. And let's face it, there's a lot about this building that meets the eye. The building helps reduce the city's carbon footprint in a number of ways. Just a quick note: in case you're not familiar with the term carbon footprint, get used to it. It's a buzzword you'll hear relentlessly to talk about reducing emissions. Think of it as the amount of harmful greenhouse gases that are given off into the environment by a single person, organization, or product. So, going back to the Gherkin building, perhaps the most obvious as well as the most significant eco-friendly feature is the glass windows, which allow light to pass through the building. Both reducing heating costs and brightening up the workspace, the ingenuity behind the various eco-friendly aspects of the Gherkin has seen its fair share of publicity, both from serious and silly sources. In a recent April Fool's Day edition, one e-publication printed a story detailing plans to replace 50% of the current exterior with grass, which would not only make large steps in the name of sustainability. But also give the building the green hue that would truly earn it the nickname of the Gherkin. The only drawback is, as you may have guessed, that this story was an April Fool's Day joke and completely made up. In all seriousness, though, the building is setting a new standard of design that other architects and city planners just cannot ignore. The building's bold and cost-efficient design has won a number of architecture awards, including the Sterling Prize, the London Region Award, and the Empress Skyscraper Award, among others. The design comfortably accommodates a large number of offices, 
while keeping maintenance and operation costs down, striking a superb balance between nature and the workplace. Nature is well and good, as long as the weather is nice outside. Given London's notoriously bad weather, the architects knew they must devise a quality temperature regulation system, and that they did. A special system designed to reduce the building's reliance on air conditioning was devised that cuts consumption in half compared to standard office buildings. There are atria that link each floor vertically to one another, forming spiraling spaces of the entire building. They serve not just as social common spaces, but also act as the building's lungs, distributing clean air from the opening panels in the facade through the entire building. The building isn't all business though. It has its fair share of fun as well. At the very top, a club room offers a picturesque entertainment spot for company functions, private parties, etc. with a breathtaking panoramic view of the city. The creation of such an innovative structure has many wondering what the future of urban planning and architecture may be. Well, if the other projects currently commissioned by Foster and Partners are any indication, the entire city constructed with similarly eco-friendly buildings is not far in the distance. The Mazdar city development aims to create a desert city that produces zero waste and removes as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it puts in, a huge feat in protecting our earth. The Gherkin is a truly impressive feat, yet it is not the only one worth noting. Now to move on to another green initiative, I'll tell you about the Eden Foundation building found in Cornwall. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Here are some tips on how to build confidence while taking the IELTS exam. Before the exam, be well prepared. The best way to feel confident in any exam is to be well prepared. Make sure you have studied all of the material and practiced all of the different types of questions. Take practice tests. Taking practice tests under timed conditions will help you get used to the format of the exam and identify any areas where you need to improve. Visualize success. Imagine yourself taking the exam and doing well. This will help you to feel more confident when the actual day comes. On the day of the exam, arrive early. This will give you time to relax and settle in before the exam starts. Take deep breaths. If you start to feel nervous, take some deep breaths to calm yourself down. Pace yourself. Don't rush through the exam. Take your time and make sure you answer each question carefully. Don't panic if you don't know the answer to a question. Just skip it and come back to it later if you have time. During the speaking test, speak slowly and clearly. Don't rush your speech. Use simple language. Avoid using unfamiliar words or phrases. Make eye contact with the examiner. This will show that you are confident and engaged. Don't be afraid to pause. Pausing is a natural part of speech and it can help you to gather your thoughts. Smile and be positive. A positive attitude will help you to feel more confident and relaxed. Here are some additional tips that may help you to build confidence during the IELTS exam. Dress comfortably and professionally. This will help you to feel more confident and put together. Eat a healthy breakfast on the day of the exam. Avoid sugary foods and drinks, as these can make you feel jittery. Get a good night's sleep.